It's a, it's a great book, equally great book, Sam Walton. I mean, if a man makes $17 billion net worth, creates the largest retail system in the world, does it all after going broke, uh, and, and does it all as a very down-to-earth, practical kind of guy, maybe it's worth reading. And so when somebody says to you, oh, gee, I don't know how to do all those things, or in a more, in a more uh, complex way, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. Very popular bestseller, now out in paperback. Very worth reading. Available in your library. And I say this in part so when people who are in public housing who have no money and can't find any, any opportunity at all, say, but are sitting there getting paid full time uh, to not have to do any work for the entire month, walk to your nearest library. Pick up a book. The book which turned me on to the whole concept of, of character versus popularity, a uh, tremendous human being, John McCormick, uh, self-made in America. First generation a millionaire, went bankrupt at 29, sitting on the beach feeling sorry for himself. An older man of European descent came by and, and, and watched him for three days and finally said, and why do you feel so sorry for yourself? And he said, oh, I went broke at 29. He said, you're so lucky. I was in my 40s before I went broke. Uh, much better to get it out of your way now and uh, <laughs> get back up on your feet and do it. And again, a modern version of, of, of Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich, A Black Choice by Dennis Kimbrough, who's from here in Atlanta, and Napoleon Hill. And translating specifically challenging black Americans and saying, here's a way to do things. Now, in this context, what I want to suggest to you that there is an entrepreneurial spirit in American history, and it teaches us at least three key lessons. And if you look at the history of entrepreneurship in America, you learn a lot because we're the most entrepreneurial society in history. Lesson one. New experiences force us to rethink old rules. What used to work in Europe doesn't work in America. Big shock when you arrive from England or Germany or France. You're on the edge of the great uh, forest. You're, sit, you're in a new society, a new environment. You better rethink it. Well, guess what? If you're at the edge of the information age, you know, our new frontier is this third wave information age. New rules are going to have to grow up, new, new discoveries, new ways of doing things. Lesson two. The market is more productive than the bureaucratic system. This is a very important central lesson. You're going to gamble on being productive in a bureaucracy, or you're going to gamble on being productive in the marketplace. Now, if you say in the marketplace, I'd say to you, fine. Why do you have 18 years, or why do you have 12 years of mandatory bureaucracy for education? You've got to take seriously what the words mean. If the market's more productive, maybe we should rethink education from the ground up. If it's, if, and, and, and so you got to start, and not, not just education, the whole bureaucracy, the whole way we do medical care. Which do you believe in, bureaucracies or markets, and why? Third, lesson three, technological innovation can precede scientific understanding. It's a very important Americanism, and we came very close to losing it in the last 20 years because of academics and credentialing. In the academic world, and, and by the way, this is a big problem with the Food and Drug Administration, Because if you can't explain it, aspirin could not be today brought to the market because we do not know why it works. You cannot do a paper explaining for the Federal Food and Drug Administration why aspirin's good. You know it's good, you can't explain it. Since we can't explain it, you couldn't do it. It's exactly backwards. But if you go to credentialing, credentialing says if you can't explain it, it doesn't exist. So here you have the entrepreneur. And again, this is, the, this is why Americans historically were anti-intelligentsia. They were anti-credentialing. If you go back and you read the, 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 you go back and look at how Americans dealt with Europeans who had lots of college degrees. And there was an automatic sense of, I bet you can't do anything competent. And the reason is, if you are driven to ascertain fact by credential, you do what your, what your tenured professor tells you to do, and that's the truth. So that in the Middle Ages, they didn't go out and count the number of teeth in a horse. They read Aristotle and how many teeth Aristotle said a horse had. Even if, in fact, it was no longer accurate. Uh, there's a book by White on medieval agriculture, which he points out that the actual practices of agriculture were a thousand years ahead of the way it was taught. Because the farmers weren't trapped into doing what the Greeks had done. So they just went and did better things. And they'd actually had a thousand years of invention by the middle of the Middle Ages in what farmers actually did, none of which showed up in the academic world. And so you've really got to look at this question of, what if it just works? Could we do it? What if we can't explain it? What if it's intuitive? Or what if we have a discovery, but we don't yet have an explanation? Could we just use it for a while? Penicillin. And there was not a theoretical model to get to penicillin, but it worked. 
In fact, you may remember the reason they discovered penicillin is they were trying out an experiment. They couldn't get the bacteria to live long enough because the mold kept killing it. They finally said if the experiment is to figure out how to kill the bacteria, but we can't get the experiment to work because the bacteria keep getting killed, maybe we ought to look at the mold, which was an accident. Penicillin was an accident. It was a discovery. Now, entrepreneurial free enterprise works and bureaucratic credentialism fails for a couple of reasons. I think these are very, very profound about how far off track we've gotten from American civilization. First, the real world is very complex. So many different things come together to make up the real world that it is impossible to capture them in any kind of academic environment. Second, much of reality is non-verbal, non-verbal, non-rational, and non-linear. You look across the room, you see the right person, you fall in love. Now, that's not just a romance novel. That's not just a movie. It really does happen. You are, you are suddenly caught up in a situation and everything in your life is going fine and you get mugged. And suddenly, whatever your current line is, it changes. Or you find out you have liver cancer. I mean, much of life, you know, you're having a really great time, you have a great marriage going on, and you have triplets. Your whole life changes. And my, my point's just that a lot of reality can't be captured by drawing lines in a board or by having academic studies. Uh, best example is, if I can, David Ogilvy, terrific guy, Confessions of, Confessions of an Advertising Man, founder of Ogilvy Ma uh, Mather, uh, one of the great advertising geniuses of the post-World War II era. This is his description, okay? He's in high school, uh, and, then, and then he gets to college. I was too preoccupied to do any work and was duly expelled. That was in 1931, the bottom of the Depression. For the next 17 years, while my friends were establishing themselves as doctors, lawyers, civil servants, and politicians, I had ventured about the world uncertain of purpose. I was a chef in Paris, a door-to-door -door salesman, a social worker in the Edinburgh slums, an associate of Dr. Gallup in research for the motion picture industry, an assistant to Sir William Stevenson in British security coordination, and a farmer in Pennsylvania. My boyhood hero had been Lloyd George, and I had expected to be prime minister when I grew up. Instead, I finally became an advertising agent on Madison Avenue. The revenues of my 19 clients are now greater than the revenues of Her Majesty's government. And he goes on to talk about being all these different things. And he describes what it's like to work for a great chef in a great restaurant. And the lessons he learned there that he takes 20 years later and applies to advertising. Because he understood that if you learn everything and keep saying, now how does it apply to this? There's nothing which is outside the box for your lifetime because you don't know what you're going to do later on. So when you say, why am I doing this boring thing? The real question is, what can I learn out of this boring thing that will apply later? It's a totally different attitude. Nothing is boring if you think it applies to you.